I think it is something. It's a very quiet ride, just a little bit of uh, slow wallowing back and forth. Jeff was cited uh, in Time Magazine in 2001 as one of the inventors of the year. Uh, Jeff is the uh, co-inventor of XCOR's uh, non-Burnite technology, which combines aerospace fabrication practices with materials common in uh, in the semiconductor uh, industry. He's recognized as a uh, he's a recognized expert uh, at the uh, FAA AST reusable launch vehicle uh, regulations, and has led uh, XCOR aerospace licensing efforts uh, until they were completed in early 2003. Uh, he testified before the Joint House and Senate Subcommittee hearings on commercial human spaceflight, and uh, his suborbital uh, space plane called the Lynx is, uh, is currently under construction. And um, uh, Jeff hails from uh, Mojave, which is probably one of the coolest places on the planet. Um, if you ever have a chance to, uh, to go up there, you can see some of the cool things that are happening up there. Some of his neighbors are mast in space, uh, the National Test Pilot School is out there, scaled composites, and most recently the, um, the spaceship company, and there's a big oil hangar being built for a company called Strata Launcher, as I understand it. Um, so if you ever get a chance to, uh, to go out to Mojave, it is a truly cool place. We, uh, we have the, uh, the good fortune, uh, Dale, would, uh, Dale, there you are. Uh, Dale, if you'd like to come up. Uh, Dale has been doing some work for, uh, for Jeff uh, of late, and uh, Dale's our very own uh, from, the, from the NSS, and we, uh, we asked Dale to say a few words to introduce Jeff tonight. Dale? Well, thank you very much. Oh, I'm actually a bit more used to being down there with Nancy taking the photos and standing up here doing the introductions, but my cover's blown and I'm now up here speaking again. Uh, as I look out on, on the crowd here, there's a lot of very familiar faces, and I can see a lot of you going back over decades, literally. And I can, I can look back to those days when all of us were sitting around the room imagining these things that we were going to do in the future, imagining a world where there was a commercial space industry. And I think we all have to uh, look at the fact that we did it. And there, there were people out there like Jeff who, ha who dedicated a big part of his life, who left uh, a big job at, at Intel because he wanted to build rockets. And he taught himself how to make rockets. Uh, he got into one company called Rotary uh, Rocket along with Gary Hudson, and uh, he, he, he ran the, the engine development. And when Rotary Rocket went down, he and a bunch of other old L5 members, and Jeff is one of our, our original L5 people, started a new company called x -Corps. And in fact, uh, Alita Jackson, who was uh, our original office manager, is another one of the, the originators of uh, x -Corps. So. It's really, this is something that I want this next generation to live up to. We fought for 20 to 30 years to get where we are today. I saw uh, some, some of you up here showing how we were going to go to the stars. It's going to take, it's going to be a hard fight, and I want to see you do it. So, Jeff. Well, thank you both for that introduction. I I feel like that hardly leaves me anything to say. Um, I, I've had to severely curtail my attendance to conferences and whatnot, uh, even though I really enjoy them, because I have this spaceship to build, and it, it's occupying you know the first 80 hours of my week. Uh, but uh, I was caught in a moment of weakness by Paul and uh, agreed to do this conference. Uh, I gave a speech. Uh, last year on the subject of space policy more generally. And uh, even though it was 45 minutes long, um, apparently you're gluttons for punishment, and uh, somebody wanted me to come back and do it again. So a friend of mine at Mojave asked me what I was going to talk about this week, and I don't really script these talks out, I just make a couple of notes, but I said in general I'm going to talk about the theory of comparative advantage and how that applies to space settlement. And she said, well, that'll ensure you don't ever get asked to come back again. Uh, so we'll see if that's true. Uh, I, uh, um, I did get a lot of comment back after last year's speech, and I was gratified that so many people found it uh, worthy of their time and attention. 
And uh, I, I do, even though I don't respond to all the comments that show up on all the blogs and whatnot, I do read as many of them as time permits. And I read the questions that people asked about the speech. You know, and, and as usual, any, anytime anybody has an opinion about space stuff, you know, there's, there's some people who are flamingly opposed and would be no matter what you said. You know, if you said the sun rose in the east, but it wasn't a NASA sun, they'd, they'd be against you. Um, you know, and, and there's people on the other side, you know, who, who think that everything done in the commercial industry means we walk on water and, and you know, we can be without flaw. And I don't personally fall into either of those two camps. But there were some more thoughtful comments. And one of the kinds of questions that would show up a lot of times was, you know, Jeff didn't do a good enough job of explaining how once settlements or, or critical infrastructure or transportation capabilities are established, how can those ever really get off the NASA dole? How, how is it possible that these things can transition to a private uh, enterprise so that the scarce taxpayer dollars can be used to move on to the next step? And that came up enough times that I thought about it, and I thought, that's a pretty good question. So that's really the genesis of this speech. Uh, so don't, don't assume from that that if you ask questions on the net afterwards, I'll necessarily be responding to them. Uh, but I thought about it. You know, in my copious spare time, when I just can't work on the spaceship anymore, I thought about how that would be. And I, you know, sat down and thought about what other lunar products there might be. I think about the moon a lot as a first standpoint. Don't take that to mean I'm not interested in other destinations. I am. Um, and, you know, okay, well, it might be this product or it might be that product, and what might the cost structure be, and, you know, what, what's the likely sequence of events, and, and how would that all get laid out? And I, I, was, I was getting into it. You know, I was starting to run some spreadsheet numbers and thinking all that. But something was really bothering me about that whole process. And one day, I, I pulled the spreadsheet open. I got home late from work, and I was saying, I can work on that. It sounds interesting. And I started working on it. I said, wait a minute. This is a colossal waste of time. Uh, this is science fiction. Nobody has any fucking clue what the products and services are going to be on, on the lunar colony or, or the lunar settlement or any of the other space settlements past the first initial beginning stages of operation. Our crystal balls aren't that good. We just don't know. Um, and, you know, I committed the classic blunder. Uh, not, don't get into a land war in Asia, the other one. Um, <laughs> hey, 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 you know, I, I'm centrally planning. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm laying out the 20-year plan. Me, you know, I, I, how, how, how deep must this trap be? that all of us have been raised in in the space world our entire lives. You know, when, when the, the emigre from National Socialism laid out for us the 50-year plan on how we were going to go to Mars step by step, and all of his successors, one after the other, have laid out an endless series of 20-year plans, not being content with five-year plans, for how every step is going to go on, right down to which contractor and which state is going to build the widget everything you could possibly want to know. Five-year plans are great that way, or 20-year plans in the space business. They give you security. They give you assurance. They, you know what the hymnal is. You know what song to sing to be in tune with everyone else. You know everything you need to know about who needs to do what to execute the 20-year plan. And you know one more thing. You know it's a lie. You know it ain't going to come true, because the five-year plan never does. But don't worry, at the end of the five-year plan, there'll be another five-year plan. And you'll be told what the next thing is that you all have to do. And you all have to believe, agree, if you want to be part of the in crowd, you all have to agree to pretend to believe in the five-year plan. You know, that they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Um, uh, central planning doesn't work. Haven't we learned that by now? Haven't I learned that by now? Uh, but we don't have another vocabulary for talking about space. We've never talked about it any other way. To the extent that even the great prophets of the previous generation who inspired me, among others, to think about how we could do space commercially, to think about how we could make it a wealth-producing enterprise, people like Jerry O'Neill, couldn't avoid the trap of trying to make it real for people by laying out the 20-year plan of how it was all going to be done. 
It doesn't work. It, and in case you haven't noticed, it hasn't been working. So I don't, just making a prediction about the future, this is the prediction like you've dropped the egg, I think it's probably going to break when it hits the floor. The 20 year plan's not going to work. So I thought, if, if it's so deep in my head that I can't avoid thinking about alternative futures in space that way, um, it might be worth discussing for the rest of you, you know, why an alternative way to start thinking about what we should do in the future. Um, I also realized that we had the same problem when I was on the Augustine Committee trying to explain commercial crew and cargo services to people. And it's the same problem. They're used, everybody in the space world is used to this sense of certainty. They're used to the Robert McCall picture of exactly what is the ship going to look like or the Chesley Bonestell painting of exactly what is the ship going to look like. Um, and the questions we would get back from Congress people were always of that character. What's it, who's gonna build it? Well, there's gonna be a competition. There'll be multiple companies building. Yeah, yeah, but who's gonna build it? You know, what districts is it gonna be in? Do, do, I, do I tell my member to vote for it or not? Uh, well, but we don't know what district it's gonna be in yet. And you see already now that people so don't get it, even inside our community, they don't get that we're stepping away from central planning on a visceral level, I didn't get it either, that what you've got is a large contingency of people out there who now that they start to realize that we're not gonna execute the NASA 20 year plan, think that's okay because now we're gonna execute the SpaceX 20 year plan. Um, you know, and, and, and it's going to be Dragon to this and Falcon to this and Falcon Heavy to that and it's going to go, we're going to follow the program step by step. That's not going to work either. The, the reason 20 year plans don't work is not because there's something unique about government's inability to plan exactly what you're doing for 20 years. It's because nobody can plan what we're doing for 20 years in that kind of detail. Uh, the, if we're going to have a commercial, if we're gonna have a future in space, it's gonna be a largely commercial future. It doesn't mean government doesn't have a role, but it means the commercial industry is gonna be a critical part of it. What makes commercial industries work is they have markets. Markets are chaotic by their very nature. If it's going to work at all, it's going to live in this sort of constant ferment of unpredictability that used to drive people from the Eastern Bloc crazy if they made it over to the West. How can you live with 88 brands of toothpaste that you're gonna, how gonna, you're gonna accuse against? You know, what do you do with all this choice? What do you do with all this uncertainty? How do you know what you're gonna do when you get up in the morning? Well, we figured out how to deal with that in every other area of our life. We're gonna have to learn how to deal with that in space. Okay, so what does that mean? And you know, part of why this was all buzzing in my head is some, it reminded me of something one of my teachers used to say and I want to play that clip for you because it might bring it home. So if you can play the first video clip. You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything. And there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask why we're here and what the question might mean. I might think about it a little bit. If I can't figure it out, then I go to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't, have to, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things. He was a, a great influence on me when I was at Caltech. <laughs> So let's take a step back, not to lay out a plan, but to lay out the limits of planning. And what I wanna do is start getting you to focus on what actually matters, which is how do we think about setting up the conditions or how do we think about fostering an environment in which even though we don't have a detailed plan for everything, it's got a pretty good chance of working out the way we want it to work out. It's a lot Developing markets is a lot more like gardening. You know, you, you don't get to place the leaves. It's not bonsai. Um, you, you just put a bunch of seeds down and you water things right way and you maintain the right conditions. And you have to have a certain amount of faith that if you do that the right way, plants will spring up. 
Um, that's essentially how we're going to have to approach fostering the capabilities we want in a world where commercial industry is an important part of the industrial base. So let's think about the moon. You know, back to the problem that sparked all this. We want to set up, let me say, a settlement on the moon. And since we can't really know what products or services they're going to export to the Earth initially, you know, and later to L1 and NEOs and Mars and Phobos and all those wonderful trade routes that will spring up over time as there are more settlements and more industries, it's a little like looking at America. You know, America was not settled because someone laid out the plan that says, okay, the way this is going to work is first we're going to get tobacco, you know, and then we're going to have beaver pelts, and later on they're going to shift to cotton, and then we're going to get oil, and then we're going to get some kind of flying machine that I can't explain to you, and later on the main export will be some kind of moving picture thing. You know, that, that, that's not how the Virginia colony came to be. Um, and we can also see, however, that it's not like they always work. A lot of settlements don't take. They don't turn into economically viable things and almost no outposts, by which I mean, you know, things that are not set up with the purpose of growing into a settlement, but they're there to maintain a presence or have a military presence or a scientific presence or just to prove that you could put people there. Almost none of them turn into successful settlements. So something's different. There, there's some set of conditions that has to obtain in order for ec this economic activity that needs to make a settlement work to go on. So what we can see from that is it's not enough to get human beings on the planetary body. That's, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition for having a successful settlement. And that was one of the things that deeply bothered me about the Constellation program, is I, I could never get anybody give me an answer to what are these people going to do after they somehow get to the moon if we could somehow manage to double NASA's budget. You know, what, they're going to get there and then we're going to figure out what we're going to do with the lunar base. Um, so if the foundation is not sound, the house is not going to stand. And this is scary stuff to all of us after a lifetime of seeing how central planning works. But we're going to have to learn to deal with it. So we can't guarantee success. Nobody's ever found the formula for doing that on settlements ever. Um, but we can look at the conditions that are likely to obtain if we're going to have a good chance of achieving success. And then we can look forward and how we're going to do that looking in the space environment. And it is so not on the horizon of most people who work in space policy. Um, so if we're going to have an environment where instead of it's someone's plan, it's kind of everyone's plan, let's look at transportation as an example. You know, space transportation is obviously a critical part of, what we have, of a capability we have to have if we're going to have a spacefaring civilization. Um, if what we can't successfully do is say, we need exactly this many launchers of exactly this type to be made in exactly this district by exactly this company, because we know that's not going to work. We've tried that. What do we do? Well, what makes markets work? We have to have several providers. Otherwise, there's no competition. As soon as you fall back to a monopoly or even an oligopoly of providers, they, they quickly control prices and services in some manner. And you know we'll be right back to where we started. The different different cast of characters operating on exactly the same price structure. I mean, there's nothing nothing magic about quote unquote private sector companies that make them immune to the same pressures that have gone on with private sector companies in the past. Uh, if you find if you have one competitor providing your services, you're quickly going to wish for the days when you have one competitor and they were on a fixed price contract. Uh, the you also have to have many customers because all the same diseases of the opposite sign that you associate with monopoly happen with monopsony. If there's only one customer, you know, they can ask for anything they want because if you don't like it, what are you going to do? You know, it's not like you can sell to the competitor, to the other customers that there aren't any of. Um, we have to have open standards. That, that experiment's pretty much been run in various hardware industries in the high technology age. You know, the, the, they don't, you, I don't go all the way into any extreme on that, but for example, it'd be kind of silly if we start putting up space infrastructure and space hardware and only one company can dock to each kind of space asset that we put up there. Um, or, or if, you know, every kind of payload, you have to decide at the time that you start designing it which one and only one of the various competing launch vehicles can it go on. You know, that, that this way lies madness. Um, 
you have to have enough traffic volume to support all of those things, to support multiple providers supplying multiple customers. If they don't have the traffic volume, nobody's going to make any money. If they don't make any money, they're going to go out of business, and pretty soon you're back into bad places. And although this is a point that's subtler, and you don't see it maybe until you're inside the industry, they, they not only have to make a profit, but they have to make enough profit that they can fund their own R&D without asking mother may I permission from some outside funding agency. Um, in my own opinion, right at the root, that's really ultimately what makes the aerospace business right now so different and, and has been so much more technologically stagnant than all the other high technology industries we take for granted, is that you may not realize this, but most aerospace companies don't control their own R&D. They have to go get approval from some sort of funding board or, or IRAD steering committee or something like that to decide if they're allowed to try out this crazy idea. I mean, is this crazy idea so likely to work that it's actually okay to try it? But if you've ever worked in high technology and research, you know that the probability that anybody can predict which of your clever ideas is gonna turn out to be good, including you, is very slim. You know, the only way to find out is to try it. And if you have to convince them it's guaranteed to work before you're allowed to try it, you're not gonna try out very many interesting ideas. Um, it used to be said that the most interesting thing you ever hear in science and technology is not Eureka. You know, it's, that's weird. Um, <laughs> So this is one of the reasons why I'm such a nut on the subject of propellant depots. Because to me, the propellant, making propellant a major part of the traffic model gives it these properties. You know, it's a generic payload, anybody can launch it, it automatically has an open interface, it's not like liquid oxygen comes in brands. The, 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 there's a, if we have an exploration activity going in a big way, that provides a sufficient volume of traffic that it becomes interesting and so on and so on. So I mean, I'm not, it's not like I was bit by the depot bug for some arbitrary reason. It's because to me, that's one, one of the ways that we have found that transitioning our exploration efforts to an architecture like that might create the conditions in which a useful, competitive, you know, real in the economic industry in space transportation can be assisted to evolve if that's something we want as a nation. Before I talk about settlement and how that works economically, I have to do a brief refresher on some Econ 101 stuff. So if you can go to the next slide. I did promise the theory of comparative advantage. Um, so this is basically how they teach it to you in Econ 101, if, if you don't remember it from high school or college, whenever you got exposed to it. You know, the, the economists are simple people and they like simple examples. Um, you know, so, so we'll have two countries and there's only two products in the world. So we'll call them US Onia and Albonia. Uh, they make two things, airplanes and chickens. Um, you know, US Onia is the industrial power. They can do anything. You know, they can make 100 planes if, they, if everybody works on planes. They can make 100 chickens if everybody works on chickens. Um, Albonia is a small backward country. You know, they, they, they're lucky if they can crank out two piece of crud planes in a year. And that's if everybody goes hungry. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can probably cr crank out 10 chickens if they really go to work on it. Um, so you get this thing that the economists call the production possibility frontier of the, of the trade space of, you know, we can make more chickens is, is, you know, less planes or more guns is less butter or however they taught it to you when you were in school. The interesting thing is what happens when you, when you let the two of these companies exchange products. Um, you know, if you imagine that, you know, US Onia has a steady demand for 50 planes and, 50, and, and as many chickens as they can get, and Albonia is making one plane, because it's kind of hard to work with less than one, and that means they can only make five chickens. If you let them trade each other, you know, America may, or US Onia makes 52 planes, and, and, and they trade two of them to Albonia, and they get, you know, 10, they get chickens back. And what you notice is, after the trade is over, and both countries have specialized in the thing that they are least bad at, that's what makes it the theory of comparative advantage instead of absolute advantage. It's easy to see that if one country is better at everything, you know, well, it makes you think they should just do everything. But you can't do everything. There's always a choice that you have to make about how you spend your scarce resources. So you should do the thing that you're best at. Well, that's obvious advice, right? Everybody knows do the thing that you're best at. What's not obvious is if you're bad at everything, you should do the thing that you're least worst at. Um, and that's, the, that's been called the only important non-obvious result in economics. 
Um, the other interesting thing is that um, the, the country or the, or the trading party that is the worse off at everything is the one that has the most gain by trading. You know, look at the example here. U.S. Onia got, you know, a couple more chickens. Well, everybody likes a few more chickens. Um, but, you know, Albonia doubled the number of planes that they get, and all they had to do was make some chickens. Uh, and that's always the way it works. When you run the numbers with non-equilibrium non trading partners, the one that's better at everything is the one that gains something, and the one that's worse at everything gains a lot. And I hope the application of this, you know, this works, this is also the same principle underlies trade between people. You know, the old example of you have the spear carrier and the basket weaver, and, you know, it's, it, they, they're both, get both better off if the basket weaver makes baskets and the spear carrier makes spears and they trade. And it's going to work when we have off-world settlements. You know, there's going to be a, a, a production possibility frontier for what you can make on the moon and a production possibility frontier for what you can make on the earth. Uh, the significance of this, and you can turn the slides off because I'm, I'm done with them, is uh, it, we don't have to know what it is that they're going to find to export. They're going to export whatever they're least worst at. I mean, we think of it in terms of the importance of it being this big high technology, super secret sauce product that's going to be the killer app that's going to do for, pay for everything. Maybe they're going to be phone call centers, okay? Maybe they, maybe they speak English, um, you know, and India is tired of doing that, and we can outsource it to the moon, okay? It, it, it doesn't matter how mundane the product or service is. It doesn't matter how, how unglamorous it is. It doesn't matter even how low value it is. You know, maybe they're going to send dirt, okay? The... Well, what's the point of that? Well, they'll, if, you, if there's a, a floating rate of exchange between, you know, Earth dollars and lunar credits, and, and all they have to ship us is dirt, one Earth dollar is going to buy a lot of dirt. Uh, you know, the, now I certainly don't expect that's going to be the product that they export, you know, I, 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 but as long as certain conditions obtain, and that's what I'm going to get to next, they, they will find something that you have to have a certain amount of faith. It always works. The, the, pro, the only condition given certain preconditions in which they won't find something to export is the condition in which the Earth and the Moon are both equally good at everything. Then we have nothing to gain by trade. I think I can state with a fair degree of confidence that will not be the case. Uh, the conditions in the Earth and the Moon will be very different. Some things will be harder for one, and some things will be harder for the other. And even if everything's harder on the moon, to pick one example, that doesn't mean they won't find things to export. And okay, now for the stinger, the preconditions. Before you can have trade, you have to be able to eat. So th this condition of them being able to find things to export to grow their economy only obtains after they've reached subsistence level. If they're starving in a constant charity case, they have no surpluses with which to trade. And that's the importance of what I've always called the cash crop problem in extraterrestrial settlement. They have to have, they first have to have something that pays the bills. Um, that, that, that says, okay, we're on the moon to do something. And as long as that something doesn't consume 100% of our labor, and 100% of our energy and 100% of all the available material resources and capital, then we have the ability to do something, whatever it is, that is over and above the thing that we're being paid to get here to do. Okay, even if it's astronauts drawing sketches in their spare time that they sell on eBay, um, as long as they have a surplus of labor and capital, they have, they'll have things that they can do. And if they have things they can do, they'll have things they can sell at some rate of exchange. Ah, but what if they don't own their surplus labor and capital? And that's, to my mind, the ultimate distinction between the way we do outposts on Earth and we have begun to do outposts in space and the way that we've done settlements that become successful. The ISS astronauts don't own their time. It's scheduled down to the mic, you know, at least down to the minute. Uh, you know, and if, and if an ISS astronaut 
decided to go off and, you know, find some new creative way to rework the carbon dioxide scrubbing module on the ISS, you know, he doesn't get a patent that. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't get to charge NASA extra for his time because he's figured out a way to make the space station more productive. He doesn't even own the widget. I mean, he can't, he can't actually change the machine without getting permission from somebody that he's allowed to change the machine. It's not his machine. It's not his space station. It's not his time. He doesn't have anything. He's a serf. Uh, we can't do settlements that way. It will not work. And yet, does anybody really have doubt that if by some miracle without a major course change, the NASA of today were to somehow get the money to put human beings on another planetary surface or on an asteroid in a major way, does anybody think that the astronauts are going to be free to do what they want? That they're going to own their time? That, that they have a, sh if there's six astronauts, do they each have a one-sixth share in the module? that they get to use? Anybody? I don't either. That's what I mean when I say this, this conversation isn't even on the radar. You know, it, it, the very beginnings of the, of the penumbra of this are what people are brushing across when they talk about the need for a space property rights regime. But it goes so much deeper than that. Serfs don't settle planets. People do. Um, if we're going to find a way to settle other planets, we're going to have to send people, free people, um, free to do things, free to try things, free to screw up, free to die, if that's the mistake that they make. Um, and we are, we, I'm not saying that because of some ideological bent, although obviously I have one. I'm saying that because otherwise it won't work. The, the, we will fail to produce the goal that I think is worthy of an economically self-sustaining settlement. You know, or, if, or if your reason for getting up in the morning is the perpetuation of the government's space program, it will fail to advance. Because if we fail to find a way to transition each step of our progression off of the NASA budget over time, then we will saturate and reach a point where it is impossible for the government to afford to do the next thing without canceling the previous thing. Um, and if you're building a stepwise progression to get somewhere interesting, and you get three bricks up in the pyramid and you decide it's time to cancel the one on the bottom, you, the one on the top falls down. I mean, if, if, this is essentially the dilemma we got into in the previous program. We, 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 we could barely afford to keep shuttle and station both going. We couldn't afford to do anything else if we were still doing shuttle and station. We couldn't figure out how to keep station going without shuttle. Um, we didn't want to stop the station. What do we do? And that's how the commercial cargo and crew program came to exist. That's a way to cut that Gordian knot. Um, and I'm thrilled with the success that they're having. But I can tell that even though on a visceral level, people know it's important. They know that in the, in the close encounters of the third kind sense, this means something. It means something that all of a sudden NASA is starting to buy things commercially. But people don't get what it means. It's, a, it's the first step towards establishing this new paradigm that there's going to be people in space and they're going to be doing things in space and it's not all going to be on a central plan. But we have just begun on that road. I can tell from the stunned bunny look. I've got it some, from some people out there in the audience that some of this is a new thought, which is good. Everybody should have a new thought at least once a day. Um, it's going to be, if it's, I mean, for, if it's successful, number one, getting, getting this cultural change through is going to be the work of another lifetime. It's going to take a long time for the memory of, of the space race between two centrally planned space programs to fade away. Um, and we don't ever want to lose sight of those accomplishments. They were, they were magnificent, in the same sense that the pyramids are magnificent. But I don't want to work for Pharaoh. Uh, and it's going to be very scary. You no, 
know, I will tell a quick, quick story. I used to be in the semiconductor business. You know, from outside, a company like Intel looks as solid as a rock. You know, it's been around for a long time now. You all take for granted that three years from now, new chips that are better and faster are going to show up. That shows up because Intel keeps rolling seven every time the dice leave their hand. It, does not, it is not a God-given right. There, there, is, there is no guarantee that's going to keep happening. Every time they bring out, at least when I worked there, every time we brought out a new generation of chip technology, we bet the company. And when it gets to be a multi-double-digit billion-dollar company, it's kind of scary to bet the company every three years. Um, but you don't have to know whether Intel is going to be successful or not in the next generation unless you're a stockholder. You don't care. Surely, if they screw the pooch and, and they have a really bad run and they make a terrible mistake and, the, and their next generation product is a total flop and Intel goes out of business, do you lie awake nights worrying about whether somebody else is going to decide to make computer chips? Of course somebody else is going to make them. There's a demand, a huge demand. You know, do you lie awake worrying about when you hear about a car company going into bankruptcy? Do you think that means you're not going to be able to get a car? No, it just means the nameplate's going to change. Maybe it's going to look different. Maybe if you're one of those enthusiasts who's really into the particular body styling of one car and you, you talk about that kind of car and you have posters of the classic version of that car on your, on your wall. I mean, there are people like this, right? You know some of them. You know, are really into British racing sports cars of the 1960s or something like that. You know, and they spend all their time keeping their old beater running and, and they, 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 they talk about this stuff all the time. I mean, if, if, if you had a Jaguar enthusiast and Jaguar run out of business, they're going to be in, they're going to be devastated. But for those of us who just want a car, it's just a car. We'll get over it. You know, and I hate to say it this way, but it's just a shuttle. We'll get over it. I want to mention one counterexample that's often brought up to the economics of space settlement, which is Antarctica. Um, I got interested in that about 10 years ago. You know, why is it that Antarctica hasn't turned into a settlement? They obviously have a market. I mean, we pay to keep 50-odd scientists there year-round. Um, and they have tourism. I mean, Antarctic tourism is getting to be a few thousand people a year. It's, it's a real industry. Um, they have resources. There's coal all over Antarctica. They have all the water you could possibly drink in slightly solid form. Um, you know, energy is a problem. That's really the rate limiting step for doing something in Antarctica. It's kind of like the moon, only worse, because uh, the, the night instead of being two, two weeks long is six months long. That's a problem. But, you know, we have this nuclear power thing now. One can envision that one could get over that. And what you find when you look at that is the technical challenge is not that hard. I mean, if you, even if you take the nuclear power out, I, I ran the numbers once. I mean, you could, the number one thing they imported in Antarctica is jet fuel, diesel fuel, to run generators all winter long. That's their number one import. Um, and because they truck, they pack out all their garbage, that's their number one export is empty barrels of diesel fuel. Um, but, um, but, you know, you could, as one example, you know, you could build greenhouses. And in the summer, you could grow plants, and you could distill them into alcohol, and you could store that all, and burn that all winter long. Um, they have everything you need. They have dirt. They have water. They have sunlight. They have air. What else do you need to grow plants? Um, they already heat the quarters. It's not, hard, not that hard to get it warm enough. The plants will grow. What's the big deal? But number one, why should they? They don't own any of this. They don't own, they don't own the Antarctic base. They just work there. It's not their, not their problem if the NSF is spending money stupidly to keep them alive more expensively than they should. It's not their money. Um, you know, they, they don't have surplus time that they own. You know, it's not like they get some benefit out of figuring out how to reduce the logistics tail for supporting the Antarctic base. And they're not allowed to anyway. You're not supposed to touch Antarctica. It's a scientific preserve for the benefit of all mankind, for the, for the peaceful use of, of, of our coexisting Antarctic nations. Uh, what's the point? Uh, in short, every condition that you would have to have to have a settlement exist except 
for the lack of people, which we've now solved by supporting those people there, none of the other conditions to settle Antarctica exist. Um, and it's a little frightening that so many people think of Antarctica as a good example for how we should consider conducting our affairs in the future. It's really frightening that there are people out there, apparently sober people, um, who, who think that something, a regime like that should be created on the moon. Um, it's really frightening that there are people who are already talking about how important it is that we preserve the purity of these untouched assets so that they can remain forever untouched. Um, I can understand their sentiments. You know, uh, nature is pretty. Um, lunar rocks are pretty. Uh, but we have a lot of lunar rocks and only one Earth. Uh, and uh, if, we have to, if we have to crush a few of those lunar rocks in order to ensure that we have more than one place for people to live, I'm okay with that. And if that is a value that you don't share, then that's okay with you and we'll have to agree to disagree. Um, and I hate to keep sounding the broken note, but looking at the lunar example, this is why, again why I keep coming back to propellant transfer in depots. Because you have to start with the cash crop. You, know, you, you have to have something that justifies the first N people being there. And if those first N people are making propellant and exporting it to NASA, and if completely unlike the way NASA would be likely to set it up, if those aren't people wearing NASA badges, suppose instead you know, that's the Merchant Adventurers Company of Tyco, uh, and, and they own the, a share in the base that they've developed, and, and they all jointly own the industrial equipment that they use to dig ice out of the ground and, and turn it into hydrogen, and, and they sell it, the product of that, back to NASA or whoever else wants to buy that propellant up at L1. Well, they're gonna need spare parts. I mean, they're not, they're not gonna, if it's a private venture, they're not gonna be stupid enough to have everything shipped up from Earth. Uh, so they're gonna have some way of making something. You know, they're gonna have some way of casting regolith or extracting metals and having a machine shop. I mean, just, even if it's just for their own spare parts. Well, that's okay, they, they have a night shift. I mean, if, if, if some bright lad has a, or, or girl has a different way of figuring out how they're gonna do things, you know, they can stay, they, they can work off shift and come in and, you know, process a little extra order and, and squirrel it away and make some widget and, and bring it forward and then maybe they'll have a better way of extracting metals and mines and resources. And, you know, maybe if they start doing enough of this stuff, they'll be able to ship something more valuable than liquid oxygen and hydrogen up. Maybe there'll be a market for metals extracted from the moon. Um, and if they do really enough of this stuff and they get really smart, you know, maybe somebody will figure out a way to make solar cells up there. And then they can be really rich in lunar credits because certainly the, the lunar guys would like to have lots more energy if they had it available. But that still may not get them much in Earth terms. But if they're making a lot of solar cells, maybe somebody on Earth will figure out, or in Earth orbit, will figure out a cheap application or what to do with lots of cheap solar cells, like power satellites. Um, and then they can make a lot of money in Earth terms. And then Hong Kong will no longer be dependent on tea and opium for maintaining its economic position. Maybe we'll be asking ourselves how it is that they got so far ahead of us, and they can be asking themselves whether Earth really is a self-sustaining, economically viable system, since they're so obviously dependent on the superior exports coming down from the lunar colony. And that's really the thought I want to leave you with. You know, the, the, I know it's a leap of faith, and I know it's hard to picture, and I especially know and do understand, it's hard to talk about without falling into the trap of trying to answer their question about exactly what is step 28A by trying to tell them what you think step 28A is. It's harder to tell the conversation to, why do you think that's a meaningful question? And why do you even think it's interesting when it's obvious that neither you nor I know what step 28A is going to be? In fact, it's obvious that the only reason you're asking what step 28A is, is because you either think I won't be able to answer, or if I do answer, it's because whatever I say, you can correctly say, but you can't know that. There are too many uncertainties. Therefore, you've conceded the ground. You've, you've said they want to know the specific step, you can't come up with it, so you've lost the argument. But that's, that's not right. Um, you, you lost the argument when you failed to say, but markets don't work like that. And if you try to make markets work like that, they don't work. The United States no longer depends 
on the export of beaver pelts and tobacco and cotton. And if we give them the chance to establish real settlements, and if we give them the ownership and the control and the freedom to try and the freedom to fail, I have faith that once they have the initial cash crop, once they are generating any amount of wealth whatsoever over and above what it takes to get them there, they will too. And I will close with a quick clip from a video I'm fond of called Keynes versus Hayek on the YouTube. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. That was a great talk. Um, we've got time for you up for a few questions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, but remember, I'm the last day between you and the bar. That, that's right. That is a uh, that is a, uh, a boundary condition. Um, you know, your talk actually made me think of a quote that I heard just recently. I think it was attributed to Bill Gates that um, we tend to uh, very much overestimate what's uh, the progress that's going to occur in the next one to two years and tend to us underestimate dramatically the progress that's going to happen in the next 10 years. And I've always been a big fan of, or I've always been a big proponent of telling people, uh, stay tuned in 10 years from now as to where we're going to be with, uh, with commercial space. And uh, that sometimes doesn't go over so well when you're working on the Hill. But, uh, you know, you've got to stay true to the faith. Um, so we do have time for uh, just a few uh, questions. Uh, I think we have some microphones potentially floating around, or just use your, use your big boy voice. Al. If you have a propellant depot, NASA is your first customer. Who's the second? My guess, bearing in mind that you're once again asking me, what happens on the step after the first step, uh, is uh, other national space agencies in a big way. And initially, in a small way, orbit-to-orbit uh, -orbit transfer vehicles and or satellite servicing systems, I think that that would that's a technology that would emerge very quickly if they didn't have to first carry the cost of establishing the refueling infrastructure. Um, and I do think that there is, um, although there's not an unlimited market for more satellites in GEO, there's probably an unlimited market for bigger satellites in GEO. And that gets much easier to do once you have a supply of on-orbit labor and propellant to enable the transfer of those kinds of things from LEO up. So Jeff, I agree with Everything that you're saying, but... But. <laughs> is it wrong to still have big picture goals? You know, going to Mars, going to Jupiter, going eventually to other stars, but in the process of achieving those goals, being flexible and working, because, because just as you, you've said, we have no idea what's going to happen. Absolutely, I think that's necessary to have those goals. I'm a huge fan of having goals. What I'm, what I, the, my, the main takeaway I want to have people start thinking about from tonight is the way to advocate for the pursuit of those goals is not to, not to spend very much energy trying to get too specific about exactly how steps 5 through 12 are going to be done, but instead to start talking about, okay, how do we set up the conditions and the environment in which we'll be able to do steps five through 12 without getting hung up on this early exactly how. I mean, this is the way planning is done. You, I mean, real planning, corporate planning, not economic central planning. You, 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 you do have to look ahead, you do have to, but, but you have to recognize that the farther ahead you look, the less you know. And you have to not fall into the trap of believing your own predictions too much. You have to go in knowing that they're just ballparks. Yes, sir. Right there in the middle. So I think in discussing this very good comparative advantage, you're missing the more interesting question. The interesting question is not about I'll repeat the summary if I have to. In discussing the theory of comparative advantage, I think you're missing the more interesting question. The interesting question is not were there a colony on the moon or Mars or whatever, would there be trade with the Earth? There would be for the reasons you say. The question is, would the net surplus of that trade justify the I'm sure many of them here yes, but I wish you would. 
Sure. Good question. Um, and for, in case you didn't hear it, the bottom line, it, putting it in different words, is, you know, sure, we can see how we can make the economics of an extraterrestrial settlement work, but will it ever pay back the initial cost of establishing the settlement? That is a very difficult question to answer. But I'm not sure it's the important question. Uh, I once tried to work out for my own satisfaction, was the establishment of the United States uh, did it have positive net present value to Europe at the time that it was being done? Um, that's a surprisingly difficult question to get your arms around. Um, it was obviously a great benefit to the planetary product to, to have the United States you know, part, join the world, um, hugely. Uh, you know, but, but the original investors had largely liquidated their investment in the colonies by that point. The, the time to pay back was very long. There were enormous intangible benefits to Europe in the creation of the United States. Um, you know, things like helping World War, and Nazism not to take over the entire continent, World War II, and, you know, the, having a place for the Irish to go, and, it, it, you know, the, the, there, there, were, there, were, there were enormous benefits that you have a hard time putting a dollar value on. U ultimately, the decision of any society, in my own personal belief, to establish settlements and to explore is not solely an economic question. The importance of focusing on the economics of it is that it's much easier to engage these intangible questions about leadership, about ensuring a future for our children, about ensuring the continuance of our civilization. Those questions are become interesting only if you first reach the threshold of and to do that, we're not going to have to suck your tax dollars forever at an ever-increasing rate. And I think it's much easier to show that after the initial investment is regarded as sunk cost, that, that settlements can become a self-sustaining growing entity of their own. I don't know whether they will ever recoup to the original investors the initial sunk cost, but at that point, the question of whether we should establish settlements off the planet becomes a policy question and a question about our values as a civilization more than simply an economic question. Let's, uh, thank you. Jeff, as a, uh, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with this pyramid that, uh, that says at the International Space Development Conference, Washington, D.C., 24 through 28 uh, May 2012. And to thank you for your participation tonight and for your sponsorship of not only the conference, but of the gala last night. Thank you well, very thank much, you so Jeff. Much. And just one last special announcement. As I mentioned, the gala last night. The gala was not, it was, it was not only the gala, but it was the governor's dinner as well. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our board of governors, it's a very esteemed group of individuals chaired by uh, Hugh Downs. Our own Buzz Aldrin is part of our board of governors, John Glenn. Uh, Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise, Newt Gingrich, it's a very eclectic group, and I'm pleased to announce that we've extended an invitation to Jeff, and Jeff has accepted, so um, uh, at our board meeting tomorrow, we will approve. Uh, at our board meeting tomorrow, we will finalize the approval of uh, Jeff's membership to the, uh, to the Board of Governors, and we're happy to welcome him aboard, and it's going to be a great addition. Thank you, and thank you, Mark.